With this video, we continue to look at the records kept by the royal official known as the coroner. In the Middle Ages, witness testimony was often all an investigator had to go on, and often the only witness available was the victim or perpetrator of the crime, and neither were likely to give a fair and balanced statement. During the 13th and 14th centuries when these records were made, people were happy to accept circumstantial evidence as fact. The investigators recorded as much detail as they were able to gather, noting the time and place of the death, any wounds on the body, and who was around at the time of the incident. Despite all of this routine detective work, it was very likely that if the culprit was able to get away from the scene, they would disappear into the countryside and may never be held to account. Let's go back in time now and discover some of the poor souls who lost their lives in unusual circumstances, and some of the perpetrators who carried out the dirty deeds. Medieval history, as you might well know by now, is told by the winners. More often than not, it's the person with the pen who gets to decide how they go down in history. But you also know that we like peering into the murky depths of the Middle Ages and looking a bit deeper than the surface, finding out the drama of real life and discovering how people in the medieval period really lived. The sponsor of today's video thinks the same as us, which is why I'm happy to be working with Magellan TV, who are working to bring you the best in historical documentaries, adding over 20 hours of new content every single week. It's the best value for both price and quality of any of the streaming apps out there. I was thrilled to discover Magellan TV as they have hundreds of documentaries, everything from history to true crime, as well as beautifully shot nature documentaries. There's a reason why they're the highest rated documentary streaming app on Google Play, and a large part of that is that all the shows are in 4K and there are never any ads. I've recently been diving into She-Wolves, a three-part docuseries that explores what it meant to be a queen in the Middle Ages. It looks at the women who rejected the generally accepted rule that only men got to be in power, and provides an insight into the extraordinary She-Wolves who decided that they wanted the crown for themselves. From Matilda to Elizabeth I, we learn how much has changed in the last 800 years, and how much really hasn't. Use the link in the description to get a free month trial to watch She-Wolves for yourself, as well as hundreds of other fascinating documentaries. Welcome to Medieval Madness. The Beating of John Lawrence on the Monday before the Feast of St. George the Martyr in the 25th year of King Edward's reign, being 1297, John Lawrence died at his lodgings in the parish of St. Peter in the Bailey. His body was seen that very same day by Adam de Spalding, the coroner. There were no wounds to John's body, but he had been badly beaten. The coroner sent for four men from nearby parishes to investigate and hold an inquest the same day. The men swear that on Palm Sunday, a man named David de Northampton was in the street near to his lodgings in the parish of St. Michael North. It was late and he was walking beneath the north wall of town. He was saying a fervent prayer as he walked when the said John Lawrence approached him and meaning to cause a strife, he pushed David twice with his shoulder. David asked to be left in peace and went into his lodgings, but John came to the door and struck it twice. David came out with a staff and hit John over the head with it. When John fell to the ground, David, quote, beat him with the staff on his shoulders, back and reins, and throughout his whole body, whereof he died on the Monday aforesaid. Because he lived for 15 days, he was able to have all church rights. However, before this, both men were summoned before the commissionary of the Chancellor of the University of Oxford, Master John Bloyo, and were sentenced to prison. Whilst there, peace was made between the two men by counsel of the commissary, and they were both freed. David left town and was never found. A Hatchet Job Philip Port of Westwall was found dead in the parish of St. Peter in the East. This was on the Monday after the feast of St. Gregory, the Pope. Philip was found on March the 8th, 1305, at around 9am under the north wall of the town. He was found by Richard de Cantibrig, who raised the alarm. His body was viewed that same day by Ralph de Hampton and John Frances, two men who had been chosen by the mayor and the bailiffs. This was because the town coroners were away attending the king's parliament. Philip was found to have a wound, quote, at the front of his head from one ear to another, so that all of his brains were scattered outside, and he had another wound across his face to within the teeth, four inches long and one inch wide, and his right hand had been cut off and lay beside him. It looked as though he had been attacked with a hatchet called a spath. That same day, an inquisition was held before Ralph and John and ten other men from the parish of St. Peter in the East who had been sworn in. 
six men from the parish of St. Mary the Virgin, and seven more from All Saints. All of the men swore that John de Burden from Kilbold Street in Leicestershire went to Philip's lodging house late in the dusk of evening on the previous Sunday. As Peter was in his room, John asked him to go with him to a beer tavern where he would buy him a drink. So they went there together, and after a few drinks, John left. Philip left after curfew and began to walk home alone. When he, quote, came to the corner under the wall towards East Gate, five unknown clerks attacked him. He tried to escape, but the men ran after him and caught him, wounded him as said, and slew him. Then they ran away at once. No one knew any of their names or where they lived. They are certain, though, that John de Burden was the instigator of the attack, and it is because of him that the five clerks committed the murder. The finder of the body, Richard de Canterbury, had pledged to stand before the judges at the next assizes. In self-defense. On the Thursday after the exaltation of the Holy Cross in the year 1298, being September the 19th and the 26th of King Edward, John Burrell died in jail. The following Friday morning, his body was seen by the coroner, Adam de Spalding. John had, quote, a mortal wound on the crown of his head, six inches long and in depth reaching to the brain. He had another smaller wound on the forehead. The inquest was held on the same day, and the coroner called on men from four nearby parishes. The men swore under oath that on Thursday last, John Burrell was seen at a beer tavern late at night. It was the house of Thomas de Staunton, and there were other clerks there from Ireland, including John de Suffolk. He was sitting in the drinking house with a clerk named Nicholas de Eulery and another group. After a while, an argument broke out between the two groups, and the men went outside. As soon as they were in the street, John Burrell pulled out his sword and attacked Nicholas, who ran away, raising the hue. John de Suffolk also fled. John Burrell ran after them, brandishing his sword, and wanted to kill them. Nicholas realized there was no means of escape, so he also drew his sword and began to fight in self-defense, knowing that he'd probably die otherwise. He hit John Burrell on the forehead, although it was not a mortal wound. John came back at him, quote, more violently, swiftly, and bitterly than before. Just as he was about to kill Nicholas, which he would have easily done, John de Suffolk came along with a hatchet known as a spath. He hit John Burrell on the top of his head, and he died from that injury. Because Nicholas had raised a hue, a crowd of people had arrived, and they grabbed the men. John Burrell died there. Afterwards, Nicholas was sent to jail at Oxford, and John de Suffolk was convicted of murder, and because he was a clerk, he was sent to the Bishop of Lincoln. Every Good Deed It was on 26th of June 1306 that Thomas de Weston died at 9am. It was King Edward's 34th year of reign, and the Saturday before the Nativity of St. John the Baptist. Thomas was hedge warden for the Abbot of Osney, and died at Walton in the Abbot's Grange near Oxford. On the following Sunday morning, his body was examined by the King's coroner in Oxford, John Wythe. Thomas had two wounds on the crown of his head, each one was four inches in length and went down to the bone, but they were not mortal wounds. There was another injury to his back. It was at the right side and near to his spine. Made with a small arrow, it was one inch wide and had killed him because it had gone through the heart. An inquest was held immediately before the coroner. Six men were sworn in to carry out the investigation from the hamlet of Binsey, twelve from the hamlet of Walton, six from the parish of St. Giles, and another six from the parish of St. Thomas the Martyr. All thirty men swore that late at night, on the Thursday before, Thomas de Wheaton went out to guard the meadows of his lord near Godstow. He often did this just in case any mischief should be done in them. He stayed there until midnight before setting off back to his lodgings at the Abbot's Grange. As he drew near to the hamlet of Walton to reach his home, three clerks named Louis de Marchia, John de Peckford, and Henry de Sutton, as well as some others, approached, quote, bearing swords, bows and arrows, and other arms. They assaulted Thomas, and he was hit on the head by John de Peckford. Thomas knew that he was likely to be killed, so he made the greatest effort to escape from them and ran away. As he did this, though, Louis shot him in the back with his bow and arrow. Thomas was given his church rights, and died within an hour of the attack. Henry de Sutton was there and did not try to stop the act, although he did not assault Thomas himself. If Louis, John de Peckford, and Henry de Sutton were to be found, they were to be kept safe and secure for the bailiffs until the King's justices arrive. Clergy versus Laity on Friday after the Feast of the Apostle St. Matthias in 1296, the 26th year of King Edward's reign, the clerk Falco Nymerich died in his lodgings in the parish of Mildred, Oxford. 
The next Saturday, Falco was seen by King's coroner, John de Osney. Falco had a wound to his left eye from a small arrow that had penetrated his brain, almost going right through his head. Coroner Adam de Spalding held an inquest and swore in 24 men from nearby parishes as jurors. They all said that on the feast of St. Matthias, which was a Monday, Falco, along with several more clerks and their college stewards, walked up the high street between the churches of All Saints and St. Mary's. Just after 9am, using bows and arrows, swords, slings and stones and bucklers, they assaulted as many laymen as they could find, and wounded many grievously. They also broke into shops and houses and stole the goods and chattels within. When Falco had used up all of his arrows, he came to the house of Edward de Hales and his wife Basilia. Falco attacked the house along with his companions. Edward defended his home using his own bow, and standing in an upper chamber, he shot an arrow into Falco's left eye, where he peered out over his shield. Falco was taken home where he died, having first been given his church rights. Edward was taken before the coroner and committed to prison. He escaped on Christmas Day 1298 and claimed sanctuary at St. Michael Church. After 12 days, he surrendered and was allowed to leave the realm. This was a case of town v. gown, and both sides appealed to the king. One of the many complaints from the university was that the townspeople had killed Foco, who they described as a priest and a scholar. There were no clerks on a coroner's jury, and the inquest was held in the interests of the town. The coroner not only had to deal with murder, but any death that was deemed to be sudden or unusual, such as a suicide or accident. Like the passing of John de Newsham, who died in December of 1301. He was a clerk and a teacher of boys. John had climbed up a willow tree on the banks of the River Charwell, near to Magdalen Bridge. He was collecting twigs to make a birch so he could punish his students. He fell into the pond at Temple Mill and drowned. His wife found his body when she went looking for him. And then there was poor Robert de Honiton, who went up to the Tower of St. Michael's Church on New Year's Eve of 1300. He was going to ring the bells in celebration, but he never got that far because he fell through a trapdoor and died. Thank you for watching this episode. I'll see you next week for another one. Cheers.